shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5 I will tell the truth for Every lie Proverbs 19.5 A false witness Shall not be unpunished And he that speaketh lies Shall not escape A false witness Shall not be unpunished And he that speaketh lies Shall not escape Proverbs 19.5「Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. Today again with collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Brett Norman, who has been on, I think, all the calls of this series that we are doing, that uh, Peter was not in Rome, Simon Peter meets the competition, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, and actually, never forget, it is always Jesus Christ against Satan. It is a spiritual battle that has been fought here on earth and we are tested to whom do we adhere, to the truth or to the lie. And the Roman Catholic Church has done nothing, nothing, nothing but lying to us all through the last centuries, almost millennia as we can say. And they keep doing that and they want to leave a lot of people without the true knowledge of their true foundation and without the true knowledge of who the real Church of Jesus Christ is. And that that is not a building where you can go to every Saturday if you keep the Sabbath or Sunday if you keep the SUN veneration of the Sunday of the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't matter. You don't need to go to a building like that. Start your own home church like I have with Brother Brett and Brother Michael, who sometimes is with us, but today is um, uh, otherwise occupied so that he couldn't join us on the call, or like we do in a few hours from here together with um, Tom Fress, and we are going to do our Bible study. You don't need a building, you don't need a pastor, all you need is the Bible that tells you the truth. And the Bible that tells you the truth is also the basis for the book that Ernest Martin wrote on the subject that Peter was not the first Pope, that Peter was never in Rome, that Simon Peter meets the competition of Simon Magus. And this is what we are going to attend to now in the 15th part of this reading. But first, of course, let me um, introduce to you to my wonderful brother in Christ over there in the United States of America, Brett Norman. Hello, Brett. I'm glad Hello, to hear yeah. you. Glad that you're there and that you could join me today. And I'm looking forward to our broadcast we are going to do here. Oh, and so am I. I thank you for, for preparing the reading and, and going through this, because this is uh, such a vital um, piece of information for all of those who find refuge in Christ Jesus and through his scriptures and rely on his <clears throat> guidance and truth and in, in, you know, sensitive matters that can't be dealt with other than um, in private. And that's really where we should be with our Lord is, is we should be dependent on him and reliant on him because he will show us all truth. He has shown us all truth. And I think that, you know, for most of us that we've had these experiences since we were little, 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 little children. And they just may have been forgotten. But they're certainly there, and they are part of our lives, and I think that those things really help to clarify later in life, you know, um, and they come, you know, you have verification through your family, through people that you know, um, hopefully. You well, do. <laughs> sometimes most people, most people don't find any refuge with their family, but mm. only, and, and this is a wonderful sentence that you just said. Uh, the only refuge that we have is Jesus Christ. 
and in yes. Jesus Christ. And that's something that we should remember, you know? We should sure. not think of um, people giving us refuge. We should not of people thinking uh, we should not think of people giving us security or safety or prosperity or whatever. The only one who gives that to us is Jesus Christ. And the prosperity that he gives is the prosperity in spirituality. And that is so much more important than the prosperity here in this Antichrist world, you know? Sure is. And the problem is that most people, when it comes to, I always use the term, I don't even know if it's correct, but I, I like to use it, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, they aren't even supported by their family. I know you are not. I have the wonderful almost exception that I'm living with my mother here, who is on the same level than I am. Not in the reading and all that, but she listens to my videos and, and, and she accepts the teaching of the Bible. And that is much more than probably you have when I think of your family. And that's not only you, Brad, but that's also a lot of other people. I mean, just think of Tom Fress, who we know who has problems with his whole family, except for his wife, but who, with his sisters and mother sure. and, and all that. And he's not the only one. And for the rest, how many friends does Tom Fress have? How many friends do you have? How many friends do I have here in this Antichrist system? Very, very little. Jesus Christ is our only refuge, and to know him is of absolute vital importance for our existence here in this world. There is nothing more important but to know Jesus Christ and to have a personal relationship with him, something the Antichrist called a damnation, called a dangerous doctrine. Yeah? And what yes. the Antichrist calls a dangerous doctrine, well, that's just a blessing to me, I tell you. Yes, it is. And <clears throat> it's just so, um, well, it's just so all-encompassing, you know, this this uh, word of God. And I think that's the, the main issue. You know, there may be a lot of people we have contact with, a lot of people we know, a lot of people we've been friends with in the past. Quote, unquote, friends, accept. I'd say. Yeah, right. Acquaintances. They yeah. cannot accept that Christ has come in the flesh 2,000 years ago and he has fulfilled the prophecies foretold in the Bible. It's, it's just too much for them, many of them, because they've been so polluted with, with different doctrines and uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing, you know, and I got to agree, there's very, very few people that I can really, really make sense out of this with. I mean, the, the biblical uh, prophecy, it's, it's really a touchy thing. And I think that uh, it's <clears throat> going to be on the, on the necks of those who have been teaching these uh, doctrines, and that's the whole point of getting out of this church system is to be free from that bondage because it really is bondage to a doctrine and enjoy the freedom with which Christ has set us free. There we go. Good. Shall we go start the reading? Let's do it. We are on page 28 on the PDF of uh, Ernest L. Martin. The Chief Books of Expose is the next under chapter that we are going to study today in this reading. Page 28, so that means we still have six pages to go until we come to the, to the, to the finalization of this paper of Ernest L. Martin. And then, of course, we will pick it up in this chapter, I thought it was chapter 10 of uh, Ralph Woodrow's Babylon, Mr. Religion, that deals with the same subject, that Peter was never in Rome. But I can tell you, as uh, Brett said, I had a little bit time to prepare the reading for today, to read it in advance, which I didn't do before. And I can tell you what Ernest L. Martin tells us right now is something that we have not spoken of before, and this is really going deep into the truth provided by the Bible. It's just a wonderful study we have here. So, the chief books of Expose. And Brett, please, uh, you know, whenever you have a comment or a question or whatever, you just shout at me, okay? I will. Okay. <laughs> there is hardly an epistle that does not mention the religion of Simon Magus, speaking of the four epistles of the New Testament. Even the scholars who have studied church history have 
clearly seen that almost all of the references in the New Testament epistles <coughs> excuse me, exposing the errors in the first age of the church are directed exclusively to Simon Magus or his immediate followers. Now what does this little sentence tell us? It tells us that the whole New Testament is exposing the errors exclusively to Simon Magus and therefore it shows who the Antichrist of the Bible is. This is a very important point to me because when you read through the quote unquote Old Testament through the laws and the uh, through the law and the prophets everything points to Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ fulfilled Daniel's 70th week with his ministry on earth seven years three and a half years in the flesh three and a half years through his spirit and then all the epistles were written and the Holy Spirit took over and now it is a warning of the Antichrist the whole New Testament except for the teaching of the ministry of Jesus Christ himself is a warning of that the papacy is the Antichrist and of the foundation of that Antichrist system in Rome. This is how you have to read this very first sentence. All the New Testament epistles expose the errors of the first age of the church and are directed exclusively to Simon Magus or his immediate followers. Simon Magus, he was the one who founded the Roman Catholic Church, who made himself the first bishop of Rome, and his immediate followers and successors are the ones who we call today Pope, Holy Father, the Vicarius Filii Dei in Rome. That's a very, very important sentence that Ernest Martin tells you, because he says that all fingers point exclusively exclusively to Simon Magus. There is no alternative for Simon Magus as the founder of the Roman Catholic Church on the one hand and there is no alternative for the Antichrist of the Bible than the papacy on the other hand. That is the message that you have to get out of here. Yeah, it's really good. That's right, You're, you nailed it. Thanks. Now, Chef's history of the church, and by the way, if you ever have the, uh, the possibility to get through um, uh, <laughs> looking all the work of Chef, I can just, um, just have a look here. I have that works here. History of the church, volume 1, volume 8, volume 7, volume 6, uh, volume 1 volume 4, volume 3, so 8 volumes, and just to give you an idea, just have a look at volume 2, this is 396 pages. Uh, the next one is 447 pages. Yeah? History of the Christian Church. This is a wonderful work to go through if you have the time. So I can advise everybody that uh, wants to learn a little bit more about this not only from these little quotes that are taken from here, but that you really can have the time to read Schaff's History of the Church. I mean, this is something I couldn't do on a video broadcast because right, it would take right. for years, probably. You know, it's interesting, Jörg. You know, you you had told me, uh, I think it was a couple years back, you know, whenever you're going to read a book, it's always interesting to look over uh, what it says about the author if you can find any information on the author first. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be interesting to look up Schaff and find out more about him too and his motivations for writing this history. Yeah. And then kind of get a bigger bigger picture of, of you know how this applies to our modern day and, and our positions that we're in it. and if we've been a part of the churches at all because I know the church that I've been a part of, I was attending for many, 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 many years, 40 years, 40 plus years of attending this church and not even knowing anything about ecumenism, nothing. So, yeah, these are the things that take a lot of time to learn. It just, they don't come right away. 
not only a lot of time to learn bread, but also a lot of time to study. Exactly. And the problem is that we are so diverted with other things in this world that most of the times we don't devote our time to study. We don't devote our time to reading. We devote our time to get knowledge based on the Bible anymore. Yeah, it's a sad truth, you know, and, and uh, finding finding a Bible study groups isn't all that easy either, <laughs> by the <laughs> no, way. No, that's It's that's not right. all that easy because when you do study with other people, you find out their difference uh, – the way that they interpret, you know, scripture, which may not match up to your own. I mean, this happens all the time. So, of course, there's divisions. And well, there's, there's a very important point you, you say there, Brett, but if I mm. study the Bible with someone who uh, tells me about his own explanations of the Bible, then I'm going to reject that person because the Bible says that no prophecy of the Bible was ever written for, uh, for private um, interpretation. I agree. I agree. But the Bible the thing, explains the the itself. The Bible explains There's, itself. And when you study with people together, the Bible like you and I and Tom do together, yeah. then we have to be of the same spirit because otherwise it will lead us to nowhere. Well, that's and, true. This and week true. and week after week after week, we get confirmation that it leads us to a wonderful revelation because I have never studied the New Testament at all. And Tom, who is studying the New Testament now without the church glasses all of a sudden and looking through this deception of futurism, has a complete different understanding and reads the whole New Testament in a complete different way than he would otherwise do. And uh, not, not, not that he leads us to the study, but, you know, I do my sure. share in that study, you do your share in that study. And that's the wonderful thing. We all are of the same spirit in these studies, but we don't use any personal interpretations. That's really important, Jerk. But the problem is, is that there's been so much, um, how do you say this? There's been so much lost in terms of that knowledge, the, the singularity of the scriptures. Um, that's what's sorely lacking in the church. They don't teach anything as such as absolutes because there are no absolutes there. It's a la la land, you know. They're kind of living in a la la land. In, Arturo in Sosa, Arturo Sosa, yes. the uh, current general of the Society of Jesus, said that truth is relative. Oh yeah, that's right. I spoke about that when I when I when I spoke about an interview that he oh, gave some time boy. ago. I think it was in 2016 or 2017, and he was giving an interview, and uh, that was in a German article that was translated into German. I read that, and he's and he said the truth is relative, and subject to change, of course, because it's truth comes out of a relationship that you have with God or that you have with another person, and it grows. But what grows changes, so. Truth changes for Arturo wow. Souza. Yeah, that's a masterful approach in deceiving people, isn't it? Yeah, typical casuistry and sophistry from the Jesuits, exactly. Brett. Again, exactly. Again, again, and again, and again. <laughs> sure is. I mean, that's all we get. That's that's the point. And, and to work yourself out of that maze. <laughs> oh, boy. That's the labyrinth right there, man. That's the devil's labyrinth, by the yeah. way. God never made that thing. No, no God is not the God of confusion, but the devil is. No, yeah, he sure is, man. So it just takes a lot of time, Yerk. You know, it, it took me a lot of time. I can't say I'm any better than any anyone else. You know, if, if you want to say 50 years, I mean, to get to the point where I'm at, I'm almost 50. So yeah, it's taken me 50 years to get here. Well, I so. think that is an important point that we are making, Brett. It is not that we point fingers to other people. Saying we are no. without errors and look at this. No, we have been in the same error. We have been caught yes, with the same have. mistakes. That's right. You're and right. now we see and now we point you to the same mistakes that we were in and we want you to come out of exactly. them. Exactly. That's you what we are going to do. Otherwise it. people say, Oh, you are just blaming other people and put yourself That's in there like you have eaten the, the, the wisdom with spoons, you know? That's as we right. say in German. Soft answer turneth away wrath and we don't want wrath from our listeners we no. want them to understand how mm. delicate this is because it's it's extraordinarily delicate when someone lies to you and tells you well here's the word of god and it's an niv they're not necessarily 
knowing what they're doing, are they? Do they uh -huh. really know what they're doing? Most of the people who use the NIV have no idea that they are reading a corrupted Bible, Brad. They do that That's in it. the in the most confidence that is given to them by their pastors or their priests, or pastors, I'd say, because priests don't even advise a Bible to read, but by their Protestant, uh, Protestant uh, pastors uh, given to them to study yeah. the Word of God, and then he gives them an NIV or an RSV or an ESV or an NASB yes. or... Yes. Whatever corrupted Bible it, it may be. Contributes. It all contributes to the end goal that the Je Jesuits have laid out through history. It's a long, long battle, man. It's been going on for a long time, and very few of us are even aware of the, the intricacy and the uh, downright deception that these people have planned for us. And it's all based on the Word of God, as far as I'm concerned, you know based on get it, giving us a corrupted, not fully corrupted, but a partially corrupted, uh, even minutely corrupted, right, Yerk? Yeah, you know, I think that is the grace of God that comes into play here. Yeah. I think that God will not allow to get his word falsified that deep that it is not recognizable anymore. He only allows a portion of, let's say, 5 to 10% of deception in his book. So that people who are reading even these can see through the deception. I mean, if you really want to, that's right. you, 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 you are going to some verses and you, have an, uh, and you don't understand them very well, and then you're going to ask questions. So the point is, who are you going to ask questions to? Well, in the first place, you should ask these questions to the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't answer these questions through the Bible, that means that your NIV, RSV, ESV, whatever Bible you hold in your hand, is not explaining itself. Then, and the Holy Spirit is quiet when you answer when you ask this question. Then the answer that you should get from that is: if the Holy Spirit doesn't lead me into Bible study, then maybe I don't have the correct Bible. Maybe there's something wrong with this Word of God that I'm holding in my hands. Maybe I should try another Bible. Maybe I should study where this Bible comes from. Maybe I should see if the originator of the Bible that I hold in my hand is the God of creation or is the God of destruction. And when you come to the conclusion that you are holding the Bible of the God of destruction, then just switch and turn to the only English Bible that you can do that is the correct one, which is the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. And then all of a sudden you will come into the wisdom of the knowledge of the truth. And it will set you free. And it will set you free. It, the truth will set us all free, Brett. That's why yeah. this is this <laughs> big picture here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The bigger picture, yes. The bigger picture. Yeah. I mean, we could go on for hours about this without <laughs> any more reading of this book. Oh, of surely this book. we have already. So let's continue. <laughs> no, it's just, to ready. me, this is a very important point. What, yes, it is. Uh, what Ernest L. Martin says here in this it very really first is, sentence. Sir. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. All oh. the New Testament epistles exposing the errors in the first age of the church are directed exclusively to Simon Magus or his immediate followers. Now, when you just scrap the part in the first age of the church, in the first age, then you know that we are speaking here about the foundation of the church. So when the foundation is built on Simon Magus and his immediate followers, that is the foundation, then that foundation is not sure. Then that is not a foundation that you can build on. As Jesus Christ already said, a house divided in itself cannot stand, and when you build on sand, you will not have a solid foundation for your doctrine. And the true Bible and the true church, the true body of Jesus Christ here on this earth is built on the true foundation on the rock. That is Jesus Christ and nothing else. And so Ernest L. Martin makes this point all through the New Testament epistles. The exposing errors who all lead to Simon Magus are exposed here. And by that you know that the foundation of every quote-unquote church out there where you can go to and attend today is built on sand and does not give you the assurance of the real truth. 
This is such an important sentence. Uh, even when I prepared this this afternoon, I didn't see this. I see this now. <laughs> I didn't prepare any of this comment here. It's just now that I see this. Wow, what he says here in this one sentence is so profound. Um, all of the references in the New Testament epistles exposing the errors in the first age of the church are directed exclusively to Simon Magus. I have to highlight this little part. This is very, very important. Very important sentence. And this sets us up to continue the reading now. Think about what we just said. If you don't get it all, well, go back a few minutes, listen to it again. Put the video on pause. Do your own study. Think about this and then continue on the play button and see what else on information you can get out of the study that we are providing for you here today. Schaff's History of the Church, and I just showed you what kind of monumental work that is, says the following about Simon Magus and his doctrines, quote, Plain traces of this error appear in the later epistles of Paul to the Colossians, to Timothy and to Titus, appear also in the second epistle of Peter, the first two epistles of John, the epistle of Jude, and the messages of the Apocalypse to the seven churches, speaking of the first three books of the book of Revelation." Unquote. This heresy in the second century spread over the whole church, east and west, in the various schools of Gnosticism. This is from the Apostolic Christianity Taken, Volume 2, page 556. But to single out the one apostle who seems to have made the most deliberate are planned, the most deliberate and planned attack on the false Christianity of Simon Magus, we must look to the apostle John. Take his gospel, for instance. While he records a history of Christ's ministry, as the foregoing through epistles did also, he has an entirely different approach to the subject than the other three. John wrote late. Times had already changed. John knew that the teachings of Christ were being corrupted by a well-known plot to destroy the truth. To understand John's approach to his gospel, we must be aware of his endeavor to expose this false system which had arisen and was gaining momentum. Notice how John constantly hits at the necessity of keeping the commandments of God. Why? Because the false system was preaching libertine doctrines, liberation theology. Yeah? Libertine doctrines, that's the same as Cardinal Bellarmine did in the end of the 16th century with his liberation theology. The false system was preaching libertine doctrines. Liberty not for the person, but liberty from the laws of God. That's what the Antichrist teaches. Notice also John's particular geographical settings for his gospel. He was the one who mentions Christ meeting with the woman in Samaria, uh, with the woman of Samaria. John is clearly striking home at something in, uh, in this Samaritan incident that the church of his time absolutely needed to know. All the other Gospels mention Samaria about five times, and even then only casually or in order to give a simple geographical indication. But when we get to John's Gospel, writing years after the others, he devotes more space to matters in Samaria than is done in all the rest of the New Testament put together. Now, don't you think that he would have a definite and precise reason for doing so? I think so. The author thinks so. And that's why he continues to tell us John is noted for his plan of tying up or capping off the gospel accounts of Christ so as to give the church a well-rounded gospel, bringing in the extra points which were necessary for our knowing. Also, John's epistles are jam-packed with specific information regarding the conspiracy to overthrow the truth. But yet, none of these works of John mentioned above represent his last efforts 
to warn the church of that conspiracy which was very much present. John's last witness to God's church before his death was the book of Revelation. Christ gave his last written message of warning of this system through John in the book of Revelation. He tells us specifically the very names of the system to watch in a remarkable and hidden way. Hidden and yet so plain once the keys are understood. God certainly does not leave his church in the dark because he is not the God of confusion. And we are going to dissect this warning that Christ gave in this last system through John and Revelation in the next coming pages on the reading of this book. The book of Revelation is perhaps the most important towards our study of Simon Magus Christianity. Why? Three clear-cut reasons. First, the book of Acts gives us the past history of the church. It tells us about Simon Magus who started the false system. Without the book of Acts identifying the man behind it all, like the man of sin, the activities of that false system as recorded in the epistles becomes obscured and in some cases even unintelligible. So the book of Acts is vitally important. That's why the book of Acts is the very first book after the first four Gospels. In the New Testament you have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And the next book is the book of Apostles. Why? Because here is already laid the ground for the identification of the man of sin that goes all through the rest of the New Testament. This is why the book of Acts, which gives us the past history of the church, is so vitally important. A second, the epistles then come on the scene, describing the false system. With the epistles, the incident of Simon Magus and Acts represents dynamite. Each section of scripture is designed to fulfill specific duties. It is when we understand those duties that the Bible all of a sudden really makes sense. You have to read the Bible through God's eyes and not through the eyes of the church here on the earth. Point three. Now to the all important book of Revelation. While Acts describes the beginning of the fall system, the epistles nail down its doctrines and describe its activities. The book of Revelation next comes to the foreground showing the false system's prophetic history through all eras of the church. We must remember that the book of Revelation intends to show us things which shall be hereafter. This is its duty and it marvelously performs what it was intended to do. Now the seven churches of Revelation. This section of Revelation gives a big key that helps us unlock the secret of the Bible. It describes a brief prophetic history of the church until the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But also, and dear reader, and dear viewer of this video, this is important. It continually shows the false system with which the true church would come in contact. Though different names are used to describe the corruptors of the truth, careful study shows Christ is referring to one general false system. Perhaps with ramifications, but nevertheless, one system which will counter the true church in its entire history. And in regard to this, Christ tells us in the plainest of words what people it will be who represent this false system. He tells us in the plainest of words it will be the Samaritans. And that is, it will be the Samaritans alias Christians or plainly the followers of Simon Magus. 
Christ gives us double witness of this identification in a most remarkable way. What he tells us in the book of Acts of Simon Magus being the beginning of the diabolical scheme, he reinforces by telling us in Revelation that Simon's followers will make up the false system until Jesus Christ returns to this earth. Now remember that Dr. Schaff, speaking of Simon Magus, says that, quote, plain traces of this error appear in the messages of the Apocalypse to the seven churches, unquote. But before seeing these clear references, I must say that the material to follow would have been in the past classified as absurd in the extreme, but recent discoveries put a whole new complexion on the matter. Now, let us see, let us study the evidence. Christ identifies the people behind the false system with several names, but these are simply different names of the same system. Now notice this. In two distinct ages of the church, we read of these people with a distinct description. A quote from Revelation chapter 3 verse 9 goes, quote, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, unquote. The actual Reference continues with another small sentence, but that is of not importance of what we are reading here, so I prefer the shorter quote of Revelation 3, verse 9. Now, this is a promise for us today in the Philadelphia Church. We also read of these false people called by this same name afflicting the Christians of the Smyrna Church era in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. The identification is repeated twice, and both are describing conditions hundreds of years apart. Now the question remains, who are intended? Now the answer is so clear. They are Samaritan Christians, that is, the followers of Simon Magus, Simus, Simon the Samaritan. Yeah? They are of the Simonian system. And the Simonian system is not Christianity as the Roman Catholic Church is not Christianity. <clears throat> That's a very important point we should make. Yeah, right. But now we come to the proof. Look again at this verse, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Revelation 3, 9. If we would take that expression out of its biblical context and, for example, place it into an ordinary secular work written in the first century, that expression could identify only one people, and especially if a Jew was doing the writing. It would only expose the Samaritans. The Samaritans were the only distinct people in the world in the first and second centuries who said they were Jews and yet were not Jews. And they knew it. The Samaritans were liars. And we will prove this allegation. Stay with us. Notice what Josephus said at the end of the very first century, just about the time that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation. Josephus is speaking of the Samaritan nation. Quote, when the Jews are in adversity, the Samaritans deny that they are kin to them. And then they confess the truth. But when they perceive that some good fortune hath befallen them, they immediately pretend to have communion with them, saying that they belong to them and desire their genealogy from the posterity of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Unquote. Now, this, my dear listeners, this is plain history. The Samaritans, if to their advantage, called themselves Jews. But they were liars. They knew better. Their own records showed they came from Babylon and adjacent areas. 
This is exactly what the Old Testament says. They were clearly Gentiles. Now Josephus continues about the Samaritans and says in Iniquities, volume 9, verse uh, chapter 14, quote, And when they see the Jews in prosperity, they pretend they are changed and allied to them, and call them kinsmen, as though they were derived from Joseph, and had by that means an original alliance with them. But when they see them falling into a low condition, they say that they are no way related to them, and that the Jews have no right to expect any kindness or marks of kindred from them, the Samaritans, but they declare that they are sojourners that come from other countries." Unquote. Now this should begin to make sense. Eh? At the time of Simon Magus it was clearly an advantage to the Samaritan followers of Simon and Simon himself to call themselves Jews. Why? Because all the prophecies stated that Christ and Christianity would come from the Jews. There was no way around this. So Simon went over to the time-honored custom of his Babylonian ancestors and contemporaries of calling themselves Jews when it was to their advantage. Isn't that what the Roman Catholic Church does today? The Roman Catholic Church teaches replacement theology. The Roman Catholic Church has replaced the Jews. The Roman Catholic Church is the true Christian Church and the Jews are the enemies of true Christianity and that's why the Antichrist is going to destroy, annihilate, kill off all the Jews in the world ever since, they try, ever since, ever since their existence. Right, Brett? That's right. Yep. Simple as that. So you see a lot of resemblance of what I'm reading here, of the things that are happening today, to what it was in the past. Simon went over to the time-honored custom of his Babylonian ancestors and contemporaries of calling themselves Jews only when it was to their advantage. The Pope only puts on that little beanie. That, oh, I got a comment. That hat, when it helps them. Please oh, do. yeah. That's true. That's true. And also, I always like to think of this uh, Titus arch yeah. that's in in uh, oh in Rome that they built in around uh, at the time after they destroyed the temple. Correct? You're yeah, in the first century they destroyed. The first century? They destroyed the temple in seventy A.D. and um, they brought this um, uh, uh, spillage from Jerusalem. And yes. here, this is a this is a picture from uh, that is taken from the Arch of Titus that is standing today in Rome, where they uh, take out right. uh, the menorah and uh, the showbread table and all that stuff, and they take all that out of the Temple of Rome, and and get that away. And let's see, maybe I have with the Arch, I have another picture. But please, uh, don't let me interrupt you. Oh sure, no, I was just thinking. You know, it, it, it's such a a vital. Uh, a piece of artwork that, that it's huge. I mean, it's it's it states uh, their their conquest, you know, to to conquer uh, Jerusalem, and they they're proud of it, and they make this thing, and it's just full of their signatures of uh, you know um, all of this uh, imagery and idolatry. And uh, can you imagine, I, I, I often think, you know, it's interesting to try and imagine how life was like back then and how they would, would uh, celebrate these things. And, and uh, they must have been uh, very um, keen on, um, Here. you know. You see, this yes, is the picture I just showed you. Mm -hmm. And this is the bigger picture of it. So this is the Arch of Titus. The whole one, everywhere you can see here, and here yeah, you I have. I think it's, it's near Capitoline Hill, isn't it? I think it's near the Capitoline Hill. Well, anyway, There's it's several, in Rome, so. Yeah, there are several different arches, though, in Rome, isn't there? Yeah, it's not just one. The Arch of Titus is only one. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. So it's confusing. You know, you can't just look at an arch and say, oh, that's the Titus Arch. You have to research it a bit because there's more than one there in Rome. <laughs> but it still stands there today. So it is out there for everybody to see. No. And, you know, isn't that interesting? They build these arches all around the world. You see these arches. Uh, you I see, here's the one Arch of York. Titus and here's the Colosseum. So it is in the, right. uh, in the neighborhood of the Colosseum. So, yeah, it's a, just an interesting fact of uh, this whole, you know, study of in Romanism, by the way, is uh, you see these Roman arches uh, in all the big cities throughout the world, you know. I think there's one in Paris, is, is there? Uh, that's the Arch of Triumph at the yes. end of this road. Um, what's it called? Um, really the, it's the Arc, Arc de Triomphe at the uh, Champs-Élysées. Champs mm. At the Champs-Élysées. And you also have, uh, in, in Germany, in Berlin, you have the Brandenburger Tour, which is also an arch. I think the problem with Romanism, when you're studying Romanism, it's, it's just too big. It, we it's have so a, huge. We have a big one over here in Brussels. Yeah, um, I bet. I bet you do. Oh, uh, I don't. I don't come to that name anymore. Oh, that That's is. Okay. There's a street no running uh, running down from that, and there's a museum on the top. Uh, and I, I was there. I, I think it sure. is called the Centen uh, Centenaire or something. Huh. Centenaire. Brussels, something like that. I I don't know. Yeah. Um. No, this is uh, at the expo. Oh, uh, there it was. What? I think I saw it back up there. Uh, keep going up. Right there. Is that it? Right there in the third one from the right on the third row yeah. down. No, no, no. Third row down. Third. Ah, yeah, here it is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is that Parc it? Parc du Saint-Contenaire. That was it. Not Saint-Contenaire, ah. but Saint-Contenaire. This okay. is it. Yeah. You see? It's a triple arch. Wow. It's, it's, uh, yeah. and, and here on the right and on the left, you have big museums. Man, Man that thing is something else. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I passed there a few times. A tourist trap, huh? <laughs> yeah. Of course. I'm, I also was a tourist when I first came here, you know, lived oh, here. Bet. Oh, yeah. That's a good picture right there. Yeah. Wow. So you can see that, of, of course, and uh, when when you can go there, you can make really nice photographs of everything that is in it, the engravings and all that stuff. And oh, sure. Of course, like with all these things, Brett, there is an esoteric and an exoteric teaching. Thank you. Yes, there yeah. is. Yes, and that's, that's right. with this thing exactly the same. But uh, when we go back to the Arch of Titus, uh, let's just go there. The Arch of Titus, that's this one. You were speaking about that, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, well, I was just going to say, in relation to, uh, you know, the 70th week of Daniel being fulfilled, and in relation to the Gentiles taking on the Jewish uh, cloak and claiming to be Jews, you know, it all fits together into this bigger picture of, you know, what really what happened. And, and how these people, these, uh, uh, so how do we say this? Samaritans? Samaritans, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How they, they took on the nature of the Jews. At yeah, but only when it was to their advantage. Right. Yeah, and, not the and only when the Jews were prosperous. <laughs> so the moment the Jews were defeated in 70 AD, the Samaritans probably said, we have nothing to do with them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. What hypocrites, huh? <clears throat> yeah. Here, uh, when we read this, this is an engravement on the Arch of Titus. It says, Senatus Popolinus uh, over Romanus uh, Divo Tito uh, I can't read this, and then Vespiano Augusto. So, uh, that is, uh, this is from the Senate, from the People's Senate uh, to the Roman uh, uh, to the Roman Emperor uh, or, 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 or Conqueror Tito, Titus, Tito, Titus mm. Mm -hmm. uh, under the reign of Vespasius, who was uh, Vespasian, who was the father of him, Augusta, who was a Caesar. Yeah? So this is the engravement in there, as, as good as I can read Latin and yeah. understand this. What I just can't here. help but mention Daniel 9, 20, 
24 through 27 as well, you know, the he that shall come yeah. being the prince, the prince and uh, how people relate that to the coming Antichrist. And once you've c discovered the people that will come, it said, yeah, in, in the Daniel. people. Oh, the, okay. The people of the prince that shall come. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. There we go. Yeah. So oh. then there is no reference to people he, but the, the, the reference must be to the people. And the right reference grammatically to he is, of course, to Jesus Christ, who was mentioned earlier in that verse. Yeah. Mm. yeah but yeah, important. I don't mean to confuse anyone on no. that scripture, but uh, we've gone into that in extensive length. And if you missed out on that, you can always listen to uh, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden. With uh, Yerk and Tom Fress, they did that in 2015, I believe it was. Yerk, was it? Yeah, 2015, yeah. That's a really good one. If, the if there's any new listeners, uh, they should check that out for sure. And don't miss out on that. And then, of course, the consequences is the yeah, next... Yeah, Satan's uh, paradise. The consequences yeah, of not understanding the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. That's part two. Those two videos are just just packed with information on on all of that all of this so it really helps you know when you visualize you can get those visuals and study on your own and and do your own research on these things it does with me you know because i'm a very visual person i work in the visual arts with you know it kind of runs in the blood in my family so but of course i'm a carpenter by trade it's only that i enjoy to do these things <laughs> <laughs> so very well your thanks yeah, thanks for your remarks here. So, let's go back to the book. Um, I'm going to repeat this first sentence we have here. And by the way, uh, we already are close to an hour, I think, right? Ten minutes we oh, still have I'm left. Oh, I'm sure we probably are, yeah. Yeah, ten minutes we still have left. So, let's continue reading this here. Because it's it's really interesting. I mean, we, have been, we have been discussing interesting things all through this last 50 minutes. I don't regret one second that we that we spoke of something, but um, this Ernest L. Martin book is really in this last six pages, and we are on the uh, on the last three pages now. He is really coming to an uh, to an eclipse. Yes, really, he is. Uh, uh, and, and this is just wonderful uh, reading this. So, let's continue reading here. There was no way around this, so Simon went over to the time-honored custom of his Babylonian ancestors and contemporaries of calling themselves Jews when it was to their advantage, and when it was to their disadvantage, they were not Jews. The Jews, however, never had any real association with these Babylonian impostors. Even when Christ discussed matters with the Samaritan woman at the well, she acknowledged with amazement because Christ, a Jew, talked with her that, quote, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And you can read that in John chapter 4, verse 9. But even though the Samaritans were Gentiles, they consistently lied about their origin when it was profitable to them. <laughs> they lied when it was profitable to them. <laughs> I call these the early Jesuits. What do you say to that, Brett? I must agree. <laughs> yep. A little mental reservation in there. A little mental reservation in there. A little the end justifies the means. Maybe a little equivocation. I mean, when you study the Jesuit order and when you study the Roman Catholic Church, you will see that... They lie about everything when it is profitable to them. That's all they do. Because they are the children of their father, who is the devil, who is Satan, who is the father of the lies. Because there is no truth in him. Now, Isn't that no interesting? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that interesting with English? You know, you have the word prophet and then you have the word prophet. <laughs> One is prophecy... And the other is uh, lucre. G gaining advantage. Yeah, lucre. Uh, you mean profit and profit? Uh, <laughs> with P-R-O-P-F-E-T and P-R-O-F-I-T. That's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's right. Yep. 
<laughs> profit and profit. Yeah. And you from where I come from, they're both pronounced the same way. They, so. <laughs> absolutely, they are pronounced the same. So you can only see in content what are you talking about. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Good point. I'm mm -hmm. glad that I caught that little grammatical joke you put out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, notice that the woman at the well carried on the fiction of kinship with the Jews when she said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? In John chapter 4, verse 12. They claimed to be a type of Jews, but they were liars. This woman is actually confirming everything that Ernest and Martin said before. They lied about their origin when it was profitable to them. That woman said, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well? Because they are no Jews, it was not Jacob who gave them the well. So she is even lying to Jesus Christ. Now this is made plain by Christ himself when he first sent forth the twelve apostles. He charged them, quote, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10 verses 5 and 6. Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter not. So what does that do to the Samaritans being Jews? Jesus Christ is telling us here clearly in his own words that the Samaritans are Gentiles. Pretty plain, isn't it? The apostles were to go to the Jews and to Israel, but not to the Gentiles or the Samaritans. The Samaritans were plainly Gentiles. They were not Jews and they are not Jews. And do you know what kind of deception we have today about the subject, Brett? The Khazar deception oh, of the yes. Khazarians, who claim they are Jews and are not. Maybe mm. these Khazars have their origin in Samaria? I don't know. That's for everybody to study for themselves. But I want to bring this broadcast today or this video today to a closing because we are starting with the review then next time with the next 16th reading of this wonderful work because this was really intense and we spoke about so many things that people have to think about it again maybe go back a little bit in the video go back five minutes go back ten minutes maybe even look the whole thing again do you know how often i sometimes watch videos because i didn't get the whole content from the beginning <laughs> yeah probably as many as i do here because i do the same thing sometimes to pause a video go back for a few minutes or even go back to the beginning and watch a video two or three times for a better understanding helps and therefore i don't want to overload you with too much information i want to cut it down right here and tell you that we are going next time into the 16th session and we're probably even going to into the 17th and 18th that's for the next time to see but this was really information packed knowledge that we gave you today and absolutely important of you to do your own studies to confirm that that you see that we are not talking right out of our asses here but that everything that we say is based on the bible on the true word of god and for that we adhere to the 1611 king james version of the bible brett please your closing remarks thanks Jörg. that's uh really gonna be great to get this this paper uh, further down the road here what uh, really started out uh, with a really strong sentence there Yerk and uh, if I had it in front of me I'd read it right now <laughs> but I don't that sentence about um, the uh, oh <laughs> help me here about their alliance to the Jews that they claim they were Jews and they are not and it only use it when it comes to their advantage yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, and not only that, but that the whole New Testament testifies to the ah, yeah, yeah. false. As much, as much as the Old Testament refers to Jesus Christ, the New yes. Testament very much yes. points the fingers to Antichrist. And Thank the Antichrist you. system from the beginning, that's Thank about what you, you wanted to say, Thank right? Thank you. Yes, that's really, really, really the point here. And uh, that, that just sums up perfectly 
uh, you know, uh, 200 videos that I've been <laughs> working on. <laughs> Yeah, really sums it up good, brother. So we'll leave that's, it at that. That's because the God of creation is not the God of confusion. No, not at all. And uh, yeah, the last thing we want is confusion. That's right. Exactly. Because that's Babylonian. I mean, you know. We want clearance in the truth, and we want the only truth that is not relative, that does not change. White is white, and black is black, and there is no gray. We are absolutists bread as much as I am and there will be no compromise made with the Bible and with the word of God and with the truth and if you want to do that well then go to another channel but if you say that there is only one truth and the only truth and only Jesus Christ is the truth the way and the life and Jesus Christ is to be found in the Bible and a correct Bible preferably the 1611 King James Bible, then you are very much welcome to do the studies with us. And when you have understood the subject as well as we are gaining understanding every time when we are reading this, because we are not knowing alls, we are learning by doing. We are also learning by reading and explaining the stuff to you. And when do you when you do the same stuff, then you have the same responsibility that we have. You have the mm. same responsibility that Jesus Christ put on the apostles when he told them, go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah? That's go right. out and teach to your family, teach to your friends, teach to your colleagues, teach to everyone who you know but teach the real and only truth of the real and only Bible of the Word of God. Everything else, every other book, everything else can only be helpful here and there, but it is the Bible that you have to build all your house on, because that is a true and sure foundation. That is built on the Word of God, that is built on Jesus Christ, who is the rock. That is built on Jesus Christ, who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by me. Until next time, Maranatha. Music